connecting to cloud server. I've got a little weird cloud with a red dot. You're all set. Okay, great. Got some more people coming in, yay. <laughs> So I'm going to close my chat screen then. Okay, Suji, I'm going to turn it over to you. A lot of people, just so you know, are um, commenting hello from where they are located, where it's raining, decent weather, LA, Edmonton. Wow. Um, so I'm going to mute myself and let you go on with your introduction and your presentation. Okay, super. So I'm on, I'm on presentation mode now. Yes. Okay. Well, your, your webcam is on. You haven't shared your screen yet, but your webcam is on so we can all see you. Okay, super. I'll share my screen in a minute. I just wanted to say hello from still uh, the middle of the night here in Kuala Lumpur. Um, it's 4.30 a.m. my time, so I'm excited to be awake and I've got my coffee ready to go. And um, welcome to uh, my presentation, which is about social change and how libraries can be involved with social change. So um, I think what I'll do first is I'll just give you a tiny intro about myself and um, how I came to think about libraries and social change and then we'll get going um, with the slides. So um, I think being a librarian is a bit genetic for me because my mom was a librarian for the Library of Congress for 30 years. And uh, when I was little, I was just like, I thought that was the best thing ever and I just wanted to be a librarian like her. So I did. I worked for the Smithsonian for 11 years in the um, systems librarian as a systems librarian. And then after that, uh, when I had children, I moved to being a school librarian. And in 2000, Eight, I moved to China and I worked in a school there as the elementary librarian for four years. And then I worked in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur here at the International School of Kuala Lumpur as a children's librarian. Um, and then I just quit my job and I have been doing a lot of work with refugees, a lot of work with really impoverished communities, which I will be talking about and um, using libraries to kind of change lives, hopefully, fingers crossed. So that's a little bit about me. I got my library degree from Catholic University in Washington, DC back a million thousand years ago. And um, so now um, I'll just, uh, I'll start uh, by sharing my screen. And we can start our presentation, if I can get this going on. How's that? Can, Michelle, can you just let me know that that's working? It's great, I see it. Okay, super. So um, I am recording, so I think I can move on. Thank you, San Jose, we love you. And um, so this is kind of what I'll be talking about for the next couple minutes. I already told you who I am. <laughs> so. Why libraries and why are they connected to social change is um, what we're gonna explore here. And I'm kind of coming at this from two different angles. So um, what I started thinking about is how in America in particular, but around the world really, libraries have been the settings where people gather. And because the whole point of a library is to share information and to give um, citizens the tools they need, whether to access healthcare or to um, 
I don't know, access to voting or anything really that they need. That's our job. We, we provide access to, um, to the tools for change. And then in my work, I've also used um, building libraries and providing libraries in impoverished communities or marginalized communities to help them access learning, access education, which, you know, we talk about the sustainable development goals a lot over in um, Malaysia and the Philippines, and it really helps them to access the tools to, um, to development. So um, I just want to kind of think about this presentation in kind of two, two different ways. Libraries is kind of the, the launch pads and then the seeds that we plant in communities so that they can access all the wonderful tools that libraries have. And libraries have a long history uh, of providing support to communities and by preserving, you know, they preserve cultural heritage by saving the documents and the artifacts of a particular community or nation. Um, they promote democracy by providing people education they need to make informed decisions about their um, elected leaders. They provide just meeting spaces or access to the internet or um, so many things. So I was reading um, in preparation though that some people argue that um, this has been a passive role. It could, um, libraries could be more um, engaged in like active social change. I think we do a pretty great job, frankly, but I agree that we could do even more. Librarians could just like, you know, take, take, the, take charge of becoming leaders for social change. And so um, what I've put here on this screen is that when I have seen through my life um, with raising my kids, with just being a teacher, with being a librarian, that three things often come together that are, um, that really make life wholehearted, which is what we're, we're talking about in this entire conference. And, and I feel like these three things that come together um, really are instrumental in people feeling a, a sense of um, wholeheartedness, of being whole, of being connected. So the first one um, is purpose. And I've seen this time and time again. If I give kids a job in the library, they're super happy, but they can tell right off if I've just made up something for them to do. But if it's something that actually needs to be done, the attitude, the approach really changes. So when people have purpose, I think their, their um, access to joy is a lot clearer. And then again, in my work now as um, the education director for a sustainable tourism company, I've seen this over and over again. We bring travelers to remote communities in the Philippines and we build over the years and years, like we don't just pop in and give them some stuff and leave. We've been maintaining these, um, these connections, these relationships, uh, over the years and it's it's I think a cornerstone of feeling happiness feeling wholeheartedness as a human uh, we are social animals um, and then I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't think that experience is a really big part of feeling wholehearted people um, can read about things they can see it on tv um, they can read about our treks, they can go to the website or, you know, you can, um, I'm a huge fan of reading and experiencing the world or made up worlds through reading, obviously. But I think there's something very, very powerful about action, taking action based on your connections and your purpose. So that's, um, that's where I feel like libraries can step in in two different ways and, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, my slides are not moving forward. Hang on. 
Um, so here's where I've just outlined that, what I've talked about. And I think there's a sweet spot in the middle where these three things merge. And that's what I would call social change and the, the, um, the change that librarians can bring around. So I just want to very um, quickly talk about some of the things that I've experienced over in, um, in Asia that have led me to kind of move away from being a school librarian and moving more towards being an, uh, an active, not an activist, like a political activist, but somebody who really tries to bring about change in a society by using experiential learning. So this is a library build I did with a school group. And um, we, we work with a tribe in the Philippines and they're called the Ayata and close to their community is, was this very dilapidated school that you can see on the left. And um, this is the part that I think we, we see where purpose and connection and action come together, where we brought these um, kids from an international school in Manila out to this um, building that really, really needed, as you can see, a lot of help. And these 21 kids just got down to work so hard with so much enthusiasm and vigor. We did not have to push them. They were like, what can we do next? And we, we got them not only to work on the space, but to meet with the kids over the days that we were there and find out what the kids were interested in. And um, so they did story times, they made bookmarks, they um, talked to the teachers, they interviewed the teachers to see what their most dire needs are. And this will be an ongoing partnership between that international school and this rural school in um, Western Philippines. So this is where um, and eventually, obviously, this building will become, sorry, I failed to mention that, I think, this building will be a library, and um, we're hoping to actually even make a kind of makerspace design thinking lab in it as well. So this, um, this is an example where I see this library as um, just a beginning, a seed that we're planting, and then we can continue to grow it and help, help these kids to access the tools they need to better their life and to make their development more likely to progress. And again, this is another school system that I worked with, with a group called Bali Children's Project in Ubud, um, in Bali. And again, we have formed over the years, I've been going there now, uh, like for seven years and um, we um, get these really terrible old spaces with rats and pigeons and uh, gosh knows what just falling down and you can see from the pictures on the right that we're able to now um, with some funding from the US this is a nonprofit this isn't a social enterprise from funding a lot of our donors are from the US and uh, the UK and Australia um, we've built now 18 libraries. And again, it's this coming together of giving people this purpose. The kids um, work on the libraries themselves. It's not just handed over to them. They have to go through the donations. They label, they sort, they run story times, they do homework um, tutoring. So it's a very reciprocal and um, ongoing relationship. So that's what I want. Um, and I'm going to skip over this um, slide because I want to stay inside my time. So here's, here's the, the, the slide that I really um, want to kind of focus on when it comes to this idea that when we put our purpose and our connection together and take action, that these are the soft skills that um, the Wholehearted Conference is really, I think, trying to access. And um, when I first started doing the libraries in Bali, I just really learned how not to do it. 
I did. I made so many mistakes. I went in there thinking that if there was a beautiful building and some really pretty books, they would come. And um, what I really learned over the years are that these things that I put on this screen are, are what will make change occur in a society. And the, the one that really hit me hard was the, the trust. Inside trust comes the communication. All of this, everything, every one of these on the screen depends on open-hearted um, conversations, communication. But the trust is what really hit me over um, the years that I was working in, especially in Bali, but now also with the Aita and the um, folks in Zambales, because it occurred to me one day that I was working with these, this lovely Balinese lady who was helping me with the library project. And finally, you know, in Balinese culture, you don't uh, go against what the, the boss or especially the foreigner, the Westerner says. And my, my friend Gusti said to me, you know, Suji, I, and then you could see she was just struggling so hard. And she said, but I don't think your idea is going to work. And I could tell that was really hard for her, but we'd been friends for two years at that point. And she told me why my ridiculous plan for this new community we were working with wasn't going to work because we hadn't approached the chieftain of that village and we hadn't gotten all the go-aheads. And But if she had not had the trust in our communication, she would not have said that. And then I would have carried on down the road and, and you know, taken a lot more time and wasted a lot more resources. So I think building friendships, listening deeply, um, being honest, and really importantly, having a long lasting relationship with anybody that you're engaging with to, to try to bring about social change, that's important. Obviously stuff can go wrong. We laughed a lot. I laugh every day because I still manage to make tons of mistakes every day, as Oprah says, just fail better. And um, in schools, we talk a lot about growth mindset. So here again, you know, you make mistakes, but just learn from them. And I, I like to say my magic word is yet. So I always say, well, you know, I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> and um, of course, cultural sensitivity. I don't care if you're in a small town in the US or you're in the mountains of Bolivia or you're in the plains of Zambales, Philippines. Um, it's so important to take time to learn about the habits and the um, norms of the community that you're working with. Just ask questions, watch, listen, learn, because then you'll know things like the Balinese have a really hard time telling you that your idea is dumb. So, you know, you make extra um, allowance for that sort of thing. And social change, I've learned over the years as well, is really important to not have this like kind of gift mentality, savior mentality. It really is, come on, let's work together. I have access to some resources. You have access to the knowledge of your community, the resilience of your community, the traditions and the heritage or the grit of your community. Let's use these together and make both of us better. Both, of, both um, sides of the coin you know, can get um, learning and deepening purpose connection together. And you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Brené Brown. And I think that if we um, <clears throat> don't show up in a wholehearted way, and wholehearted means the whole of you. It doesn't mean just like, I'm gonna show you my productive work side that knows how to get stuff done. And, I mean, say like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I tried this thing, it didn't work. Let's try again. Can you help me see what I'm doing wrong? I think this idea of vulnerability being a courageous act is really true. We need to um, show up and say, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm, I'm unsure. So those are kind of the wholehearted skills that I would um, recommend when approaching this idea of trying to bring about social change in the communities that we all work in or the communities that we 
um, want to help with, even if we don't work in that community. Um, and so, of course, if my if I put purpose and um, connection together and and say that doing is the action part is the um, the key here. This is what I want to leave with is kind of like, well, you know, what can I as a librarian do? Well, I think we already do so much. We have our libraries, whether they be university or school or public or anywhere, it's always an inviting um, space. Librarians, we love, we cherish helping people access ideas or information or tools to empower themselves. So I think that's a given. I think all of us would agree that librarians feel really strongly about being that in our in our communities, whatever those communities are. So if you want to uh, kind of, you know, like crystallize that and bring it into um, into action. Uh, I'm we, we talk a lot in education about the design cycle. And here's, you know, curiosity is always the beginning part. Notice things, like notice what bothers you. I always tell my students when I go out into the country with them or wherever, like notice the things that don't sit right with you. And then those might be something that you wanna dig down a bit and use your research skills to find out more about. And share your questions with the community. Other people will be like-minded you can find the, the tribe that's interested in the same um, ideas that you are. Ideate, just come up with ideas, just throw everything out there, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, and then call from there. And then in the end, here's, uh, the Japanese have that saying, right? Like, um, fall seven times, get up eight. Just keep iterating, just try something. Uh, you know, don't get, um, what do they call it? Par paralysis of perfection. Just give it a go. Host, host a talk in your library about homelessness or, uh, you know, I hate to even give suggestions because all of you listening to me now probably come from a million different backgrounds and, um, you know, and have ideas that I would never be able to come up with. So, um, I just more have this idea like use use um, the tools of, of design and creation to design and create your own ideas for social change and social betterment in your community. I think I'm running out of time. So um, here's just a few uh, ideas I had. I'm a huge fan of Room to Read, if you haven't heard of it. Um, John Wood is the founder. I think he was a big shot at, I never remember, Microsoft or somewhere like that. And he left and he's, um, he builds libraries worldwide and the library project is similar. So, um, you know, if you want to work with libraries um, around the world, th those are two good places to start. But if you want to start in your own local community, then there's um, many, many ways that um, you can get curious about what needs help, you probably already know, and um, begin by getting people involved, connected, and getting that sense of purpose. I love this quote, bad libraries build collections. I don't agree with that. I think, you know, just a plain old library builds collections, good libraries build services, and great libraries build communities. Um, and that is that and I think Michelle is my lovely co-moderator. Michelle? I am here for you. So Yay. there's a lot of comments. Um, I think let me, uh, there's several questions. So I think I'll, I'll pop to the questions and then if we have time I can read some of the comments that have come in. Okay. Um, so go ahead and place com uh, questions in the chat. Um, Here's a first one from Stephen, and I might get this wrong, I apologize, uh, Levoy. Stephen asks, wouldn't we need to, to have a goal for specific kinds of changes and remain cognizant of our own biases based on values and class? Wow, that is a really important question. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a huge discussion that I can't address in five minutes. 
but I think the main thing that I've seen with addressing biases and goal and um, perspective taking is to invite a lot of diversity into the the tribe, the team that you work on with on a project. So, um, so that, I mean, diversity is such a powerful tool because we, um, it is hard to see, they're called blind spots for a reason, we're blind to them. So it's great if you can find a, a group of diverse people to work with, or at least a group of people who are willing to um, look at your ideas and you can run past the, the them, the things that you're thinking about and just get a lot of input from different arenas. Um, I hope that's enough of an answer. If not, Stephen, you can reply yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, or, or email yeah. her. Yeah. Um, I'll go to the next question. Uh, Aaron Brown asked, would Librarians Without Borders count as an NGO? I don't know if you're familiar with Librarians Without Borders. I, I have. I've actually, yeah, kind of wanted to work with them. I believe, yes. I believe they have NGO status. Uh, I could... Google that, but I don't want to go out of my Zoom um, session. I'm nervous about that. But I think, yes, um, I believe LGO, I, I mean, LGW, I think they are, um, I don't know, but I'm going to, I'm going to guess that, yes, they qualify as an NGO. I think they have that status. And then Erin, you can always email her to continue yeah, that conversation. For sure. For sure. Um, here's a question from Emma. What are your recommendations for responding to people who say that libraries aren't supposed to be agents of social change? Well, I would argue actually that we are just by existing because when you give a population access to information, you're already an agent for social change. I mean, that's what's beautiful about our democracy. Frankly, public libraries started in America because there's this whole idea that if you can access um, information and somebody can help you with the access to that information by curation or just having, right now, it's just like having a computer and being able to access the internet if you don't have that on your own, but also, to point you in the right direction and to show you what tools you can um, have access to, we already are, whether we like it or not. So I would, I would argue with those people that um, it's too late, one. And secondly, um, I would like to know their reasoning as I would, get curious with them and ask them why they're asking that question. Like, what would they prefer? Okay. And um, Emma, if you have a follow-up, you can place that in the, um, in the chat. Uh, let me read some of, I don't see any other, oh, there's a couple more that, questions okay. that came in. Um, what does NGO stand for? Oh, sorry, non-governmental organization, sorry. Uh, and then this means a non-profit, um, yeah, non-profit. Um, and Aaron said, yeah, don't we act on the First Amendment, freedom of assembly, religion, and speech. So the yeah. big push, so Emma, follow up here. So really the big push for social change that we're seeing is an extension of what we already do. I agree wholeheartedly yep. <laughs> to use that word. <laughs> um, Carla mentioned librarianship is a social science. Um, yes. And okay, there's been some postings about librarians without borders. So there's links and some follow up for those that want to take a look at that organization. In the chat. Okay, great. I will tell you there's some other comments that I think are worth uh, mentioning in the next few minutes, unless other questions trickle in. Um, Deb um, Abraham mentioned this really speaks to how international experience can inform librarianship in communities closer to home. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, 
Marion mentioned, I work with asylum seekers and the trust is so necessary because people often do, don't want to counter, even you're not uh, actually helping, even if you're not actually helping. Wow, so true. I think that's why this idea of extended relationships and really, yes, uh, I've seen it over and over again. Uh, change can happen without trust, but often, like she says, it can just be in the wrong direction because you're not having an honest and trusting um, exchange of ideas and um, information. Um, Steve Ann, I'm going to scroll back up just a few more comments. We still have what, a minute and a half. Okay. Um, this is not just in other countries, and this is from earlier, working in an urban library in a poverty-stricken area of a major U.S. United States city, almost no libraries in schools, unfunded public libraries, even academic libraries can play a role in providing these key ingredients to build community relationships. Yeah, it's really true. I mean, I know I've been kind of lucky in that the schools and the communities that I've worked with, I've managed to find funding from here or there or somehow. But um, like tomorrow I'm giving a talk at the UN Commission for the High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, working with refugee schools on how to build and maintain and organize libraries here in Kuala Lumpur. We have a huge refugee population here. And the access to resources is, is just horrible. It's, you know, they barely have anything. And yet I think librarians just persevere in not giving up and keep trying to, to bring information and access to people. Excellent. Thank you, Suji. I know we're at the top of the hour. So okay. I just want to thank you for your presentation, the insight and everything you shared with us and inspired us to see, you know, maybe directions we want to go into. Great. Uh, so I so hope that, um, yeah, I so hope. Yeah. That. Thank you again. And remember everyone, this was recorded. So you'll have access to this afterwards. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.